Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to Tiono, the last of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. United Kingdom lover, but who governs Britain, really? Evenings in Parliament had a specific routine, one that was both tiring and frustrating. Members would flock to their seats in an unassuming MP would raise an issue. Fountain and Butler's men would search, screech at each other for hours on end, often involving outright shoe-throwing, a vote would be held, and then everyone went home. This time, however, it was not such an evening, and Brian knew it very well for the past few months. The commander of the garrison, propped up by Germain, had been increasingly showing up on the Parliament's floor. Br Brian, at first, believed that this was due to the Prime Minister's asking for advice following the restructuring of our armed forces, but with Commander Wolf appearing at a more consistent rate, the somber truth dawned upon him. Britain was nothing more than a glorified puppet of Germania in general, and the garrison in particular. The party may delude itself into thinking of our relationship as that of two brotherly nations staying side by side in the New Order, but reality here is a shackled one. Not us, that's for sure. An evolution. The will of the people is uh, inimical through the development of a strong, nationally coherent society, it is important that the government and the state exercises a state necessary guiding hand, so that a revolutionary spirit is directed towards a positive end. John Bean scrutinized the passage carefully. His newest book was a masterpiece, if he said so himself. A manifesto for the new Britain that he would, uh, he would see come to be. That being said, even the ko ai nur diamond had to be cut before it reaches true potential, looking over the term revolutionary spirit. His eyebrows shot up. The entire paragraph could possibly be misconstrued as pro bolshevism Bean curse occurs... Uh, for a soil in the spirit of the common man before crossing that sentence out. <clears throat> Though the will of the people is in inimical to the development of a strong, nationally coherent society, it is important that the government and the state exercises a uh, necessary, necessary guiding hand, so that the revolutionary spirit is directed away from Judeo-Bolshevik corruption towards an end that will be benefit of the nation itself. He nodded to himself, satisfied, the words ring much truer now. A strong, nationally coherent society, Britain could only have claimed to be. Dunville did a decent enough job to keeping the nation from collapsing altogether, and that much was true, but he was no real fascist. He was an old friend, or, or not really a friend, but an old, tiring, bored man, who ought to make a way for a newer generation of leaders, like Andrew Fountain, for instance. Fountain was a man being could respect, stronger and dynamic, everything that the opposing rebel was not. When man inevitably took power, being knew he had to buy, be by his side. A person surely free of his chains, now wouldn't that be glorious? But alas, that would be the future. Bean snapped himself out of his daydream and continued to scan the manuscript, determined that one day it would be treated as one of the texts that define the new Britain. The scribe toils, desperate to be seen. Or at the very least heard. At least we got a good surplus, because the debt at GDP ratio is doing very well, very, very well. And at least the poverty's not getting worse. It's John Gordon reigns supreme, and we're reading and doing about an old companion, which we read last time. A deal with our party, huh? The army issue expand their interests. Ooh, but more growth. Business taxes goes down, but we get more growth. Replace German corporate dominance with a retrenched conviction. Ideologues will gain two and a half influence over the German corporations, or stabilize their growth. Pragmatists, oh. We lose growth, but we lose inflation, which is good. Uh, well. Rex Vecca, Siemens, and Company. With the collapse of the British Empire and the loss of the great economic network, it's no surprise that the following World War II our economy was a mess. Any growth we could have had tied down in reconstruction and reparations, yet as they always do, the Germans offered a helping hand in our darkest day, and the corporations generously invested in our nation, helping our broken Britain, our British industry rebuild. Yet over 200 past, over the past 200, 200, 20 years, not 200, this is not old world blues, with their role in reconstruction, German mega corporations have come to symbolize the economic control the Germans possess over a country with this power, it's absolutely necessary that any successor to Domville possesses the approval, for they were to abandon us. We might return to the squalor misery of the 40s. Disney for the dread. Donville remembered the first time uh, he stepped into Germania. He was now one of the younger ministers sent at the time, which was saying something considering how old he was at the time. And vividly remembered stepping off the plane and seeing the teeming masses all cheering the newly built capital, the national uh, daddiest vision, now permanently etched upon the face of the earth in immutable rock, granite, and glass. He had never truly brought, bought into the idealistic side of things in that way, like some others in his party had, but he could understand where the crowd's joy came from. Constant propaganda tended to make one view the erection of a sprawling ideological monolith to be the greatest of their own country as nothing but a good thing. But as Barry Dombo put up his umbrella as he walked through the streets of Germania, that fire was gone. This place was a heavy, stagnant malaise that filled the air. It was similar to the coming of a thunderstorm amused. There was something deeply wrong with the city that all the towering spires and grandiose monuments could never truly mask, arriving at his destination. Donville shook off his umbrella and entered. There would be a few days of whining and dining with the German elite, and there would be business. Briefly looking back out of the increasingly dark city, he suppressed a shudder. All this feeling was not important of things to come. The facade cracks. A little bit of chaos, huh? Mm, German corporations, eh? So for this one, where do we go? Two and a half influence. Only two and a half. It's not very much. Pragmatists? I do not want to hurt growth, so we're not going to do that one. Definitely not. Poverty will get worse, though. Oh, I don't like that one either. 
Southeast changes for ownership too, huh? Don't necessarily like that either. No matter what we do, it's gonna increase chaos, so. We're just gonna do that one instead. Old friends, Prime Minister, what can I do for you today? said Lord Portsmouth, shaking his old friend's hand with a grin before reclining into one of the meeting room's immaculate leather sofas. Uh, <clears throat> he rested his cane across his legs and leaned forward attentively to Dombell as he began to speak. What can what you can do, Lord Portsmouth, is something I think you'll enjoy very much. I know we sized up the issue last time we met about the Freedom of Security Act. We simply cannot afford to ignore it any longer. The House of Lords needs a good cleaning, and you'll be the one holding the duster. At this wall, I couldn't help but smirk. Finally, those pencil posters in the Commons at least one had at least realized a mortal peril the House of Lords, and by extension, all of Britain was in. The corrupt sycophants, with that Obden and his ilk plagued their pillage their land for mere bribes. The apathetic disgraces that shamed their ancestors by not even bothering to turn up. The flagging spirit of those who were supposed to be defending Britain from the Judeo Bolshevik menace, it was disgraceful, truly, but not unsalvageable. Thank you, Prime Minister. Rest assured I'll get the Opera House back into shape soon enough, replied Wallop. Drawing a relieved nod from Domville, but the strained look on his face did not leave, even as he tipped his back a glass of freshly poured whiskey. Good, good. See if you can't clip the wings of that upstart fountain and the weasel butler while you're at it. The BPP is our party, Gerard. Ours. We made it. We'll bloody keep it and keep leading it well, no matter what the others think. To that, Wallop could only smile and raise a glass of his own in agreement. The old guard rallies once more. Yeah. Decaying Titans. Adolf. Hitler. I've been a larger than left figure. His influence had shaped the world for decades, and he could be felt virtually anywhere. Undoubtedly, one of the history's greatest men. On the few occasions Domple had previously personally spoken to the Arfur, his keen intellect and sharp wit had shown through every word he had said. Truthfully, it was almost captivating to see him speak. If Domple had not been told that the shriveled old man in front of him was Hitler himself, he would not have believed it. Ah, Herr Lord George, uh, George, he said upon entering the meeting room and walking over to shake Domple's hand. How pleasant to see you again! It's been rather too long. Domple had only half heartedly corrected him before the conversation moved swiftly onwards. Matters did not improve as the meeting went on, at several points. He seemed to space out entirely, having to be dragged back to reality by Domville. It all got too much eventually, and his personal guard barged in and hurried the fear away. As they left, Hitler turned around and looked at Domville, saying only one thing. I'm most pleased with your work so far, Herr Chesterton. Stable as a growth. As any economist could tell you, from a Keynesian to a Hakim, the stability of a nation is absolutely necessary for any prosperous economy. With the economic collapse of the 40s and the instability of the 50s, one may be hesitant to call investment in Britain a wise option with a persistent strain of resistance. Thus, to secure continued investment to ensure the profit for both us and the mega corporations, we must move to keep the profit stable and set it aligned for a minimum production. With these moves, we should keep a good steady flow of capital and continue our economic recovery. The power behind the throne. Are you enjoying the tea, Herr Domville? Mont Bowman asks, uh, sitting rather rigidly in front of Domville. He sipped it lightly, not too cold, but definitely not as warm as he was used to. Delightful. Thank you, uh, Pata Kanzler. What did you get it? From India, I believe, he said, taking a sip from his own cup, although, as far as I know, it made quite the journey to reach us here in Germania. It came from a third-party supplier, you see. Donville nodded, pretending that either of them truly cared about the tea. A moment of silence passed before Bormer spoke up once again. You will have noticed, when he spoke with the fear, that he was <clears throat> distracted. Donville almost spat out his tea with how blunt the party chancellor was. He once again nodded, his time more hesitantly. Is this a cause for concern? Bormer shook his head vigorously. There is no illness on earth that our fear cannot overcome, most assured, nonetheless. I understand that your discussion cannot be fully completed, therefore, I am here to continue the discussion in his stead. Is this clear? Donville briefly mused as to whether Hitler had specifically requested that it was to be Bormann who met with him, or whether he simply decided that it was to be. That would be fine, yes, thank you, he said, putting down his cup. Bormann nodded affirmatively. So good, now. Yes, we, to stop, we need to know. In what area is Britain most likely to require German aid in the near future? Security, doubtlessly, the resistance is nearly crushing. It's nearly crushed. Why sustained economic growth would be of use, certainly. Oh, God. Which one do I choose? A resistance or economic growth? Fair hand, huh? The army issue. The support force of the garrison. Um, I like. I always like the economy, so I don't know. Tame rural Britain, huh? Ooh, it's great. Ooh, I like this a lot. Till we built Jerusalem. We're going to explode anyway, so we're going to stabilize the growth first, right? And the 1962 fiscal report. 
the dawn of a new year for Albion. So come to your yearly fiscal reporter, view the economic progress we've made and what more can be done. Unfortunately, despite our great recovery since Sea Lion and the fall of the Empire, we still suffer from the after effects of this great transformation, alongside the residual economic malaise from the fall of the Empire. The resistance was still plagues our great nation, hampering our efforts to move back to the devastation in the post war years. Those reports are primarily for us. We will be sharing the support of the great benefactor, the German Reich, who, as our greatest ally, will be eager to learn about the economic progress we've made. Taking pot shots. Looking slightly better. Oh, inflation is slowly getting curbed. Nice. We're growing. Good. And your spus is up. Um, what do we have here? Eddie Locks, huh? Give us like the German corporations, of course. No one received a boost, eh? So that increases income taxation. Ooh. Hmm. Change despotism popularity. Costs a lot of money for this one. Because right now we're stuck to the peers. I and mean, we're fine with the peers. Is there anything else that we could really benefit from? I mean, more money. Slightly, slightly, slightly more money, maybe. Um, but nothing too dramatic here. Oh. Erd conciliation. Oh, I might remove some. So, okay, taking pot shots. Bang, bang, bang. Emma sat in frustration reloading the rifle. This would be her third try. The green bottle sat upon the tree stump completely undamaged as if they were mocking her. She tried again, finally getting one. Yes, she yelled, raising her fist in the air. Well done, love, Elizabeth said, hugging her from behind. But your technique could do some work. Emma scoffed incredulously. Come off it, Lizzie. We're both beginners. It's not like you could do much better. Elizabeth only smiled sweetly and just for Emma to pass the rifle. She complied. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, placing the shattered bottles and gesturing at the stump. Fire away, she shouted. Elizabeth then aimed the rifle at the bottles and pulled the trigger and banged five times. Emma's jaw dropped as Elizabeth turned around to face her. She had shot all the bottles on her first try. How's that for a beginner, hmm? Why, uh, how? Emma spluttered. She took Elizabeth to be many things, but an avid rifle user was not one of them. The other woman simply giggled. Father used to work with some rich men, and they went on hunting trips together. Sometimes he'd take me and show me how to do it. Can't say he would have expected me to be using those skills like this, though. Emma was simply stunned. Can you teach me? She asked. Of course, sweetie, now your posture's all wrong. I don't know, my posture's pretty wrong too, usually as well, when I go shooting myself. Well, I don't shoot myself, that'd be bad. Probably. I don't know. We'll see. Um, temp tax hike. Just pay all that debt faster. I like economic growth. Like an angry schoolboy. Where in God's bloody name was Andrew Fountaine? Uh, Dom Dodd paced his office irritably, waiting for his home security's arrival, rearranged the papers on his desk, sent for tea, and read every seemingly interminable report Philby had sent him. Yet Fontaine was still nowhere to be seen. The office was still empty aside from him, and there was no knock from the secretary forthcoming. This was, he was grumbled internally, the sort of thing that in less politically precarious times saw cabinet ministers sacked. Another ten minutes passed. Then another, then another, with Fontaine remaining as mysteriously absent as ever. For a moment, the prime minister worried that perhaps something had happened. Could it be the resistance had struck? No, calm yourself, ma'am. The resistance was all but broken, and he knew that home secretary would have been in Whitehall all day and today. A mere ten minute walk down Downing Street, from Downing Street, and surrounded by security. So where the heck was he? Frustrated, he stood by his desk and threw open the door above his office, startling his secretary. Go to Westminster, tell them I sent you, and find out where Andrew Fontaine is. The secretary nodded and hastened to obey, throwing on his coat. It was another twenty minutes later when his secretary returned alone, an apologetic expression on his face. He shifted from foot to foot, uncomfortably in response to Donville's demanding expression. I'm very sorry, Prime Minister, but, uh, <clears throat> he said hesitantly, trailing off. They've been screaming, sir. The Home Secretary and the Chancellor have been yelling at each other one for the better part of two hours. I was able to calm him down, and Mr. Butler and Mr. Fountaine sent their apologies. The Home Secretary also indicated that he's available, he's available now. I'll have a meeting with Wiesenmeyer Vess in ten minutes, muttered Donville incredulously. He shook his head. Go back there and tell him I want to, him to reschedule. Working 99. Press button, assemble, put on conveyor belt, pull lever. Press button, assemble, put on conveyor belt, pull lever. That's what Ernie Smith spent most of his waking hours doing. Working in a German-owned factory wasn't one of the worst jobs a man could have in Britain nowadays, granted. It thanks his lucky stars that he wasn't one of those poor sods down in the mines, at least. But the work was still mind-numbing, tedious, and long. So, so long. He barely had time to sustain himself beyond a light breakfast in the morning and a light dinner when he got home at night. The rest of this free time was spent sleeping. The factory was full of men like him, English. Working class. Born in Britain alone with nowhere else to go. So they all got just got on with it and accepted whatever the Germans told them to do. Oh god, we're 10%, huh? That's not good. Across from the room, a sharp and angry voice could be heard. It was Herr Funk, the pudgy, balding overseer. He was scolding one of the younger lads for cocking up the assembly. Only felt the hatred that he had for that crowd's bubbling up to the service. Uh, they were all like that, unforgiving, uncaring, harsh for no reason, and yet they all got to drive around in fancy cars and wear nice suits while Ernie and the other workers got back all. It was wages hadn't changed in the five years he'd been working there. Old Bill, who'd been there longest, said he had... Once that the last time he was raised was 1954. It was all just such a crap situation, but what could someone like him do about it? 
After clocking out of the shift at 9.30 p.m., he was approached by a man he'd never seen around the factory before. He said he used to work there before he left and joined a new business. Then he went around and said aloud ev everything that Ernie had been thinking all day, about the hours, pay, the Germans, the lot. The mystery man then gave Ernie a leaflet, telling him to come to the meeting he and his mates had at the pub every week. As the man walked off into the night, Ernie looked closer to the pamphlet, which had, been, had an all-too-familiar phrase emblazoned at the top. Workers of the world unite. Pragmatists. One more chaos. Back home. Ah. The rain clouds march further into London, pounding on the roofs of millions. For ones in the cars, the rain above the serves as a constant reminder to keep driving. Everybody wants to see their family again, so keep going. There's always more work to be done in Britain. Howard Wilson took a puff from his pipe, filling his entire office with smoke. For being a cabinet minister, Sorrow had gripped him harder than he had ever faced since the end of the war. Important papers and many clicking pens were scattered across the floor, and any comments made to clean up the mess were dismissed. The bags below his eyes could only darken as the days went by, and pressure from outside could not help him at this point, and as much as he could pray to the gods that Dumpa would be struck down or replaced by Butler, he knew that those prayers would remain unheard. All hope had been lost a long time ago, why hope now? News of the ideologue's recent defeat with the Black Shirt's authority ne bill never surprised Wilson. Given a de facto company of Fountain and Chesterton, full authority over police forces just because of some more smaller activities in Cornwall, would swoon any member of parliament with a sort of dignity. Uh, Wilson's hope for change had died a long time ago. Brent's car was pulled over by the Germans, removed and destroyed on the side of the road, and replaced with the engine of a Panzer. Landing struck out car outside, alerting Wilson back to the streets of London, despite all the rain, all the thunder, and the desperate state it seemed to be in. The people so trudged it, all to get to the door. Uh, Wilson stood up from his chair, stretched for a small second, and started picking up the pens. Minus 10, well... Doesn't seem like it's working very well right now, is it? Has it reached a new threshold? Yeah, also I've been told this is a little kind of bugged, so... So go figure. Stabilizing the growth, because we have to. Let's go report. Beans experiment. Absorbing a colossus. Workforce or Workplace Organizations Act of 1962. Interesting. Or speaking with the unions. Among BPP, there are very, very few that are sympathetic to unions, from aristocrats in the House of Lords to the ideologues within the House of Commons. Some even the pragmatists can't help to spit nails when they're just thinking about trade unions. Rab Butler, as one of those lucky or <clears throat> unlucky few who are seen positively by the unions. With this in mind, we shall send Butler to reconcile with the unions, hopefully guiding them to away from Jones's cruel grasp. Perhaps with Rab, we can win back the unions from the Iron Fist of Social, and then rip out the infrastructure of the resistance. Oh, that'd be nice. But you know, you never know. Conversations with a snake. It's pretty normal, isn't it? Days in Parliament. It really did irk Jane Birdwood, the second Baroness uh, Birdwood, that she wasn't really able to assume her husband's seat in the House of Lords after his death some months ago. Uh, it had been bad enough for her in-law family still scorned her, even at the funeral, still in a huff for some reason about how she had foreign or torn the family part or something like that, and having an affair with the Baron Birdwood, and then marrying him after he divorced the cowboy wife. It really was ever so petty. As Prime Minister Donville finished his speech, Birdwood joined in the applause to the measure for more German investment, no doubt proposed by that little rap, but... Uh, Butler, who was sitting next to the PM. The House of Commons was simply too common for a woman like her. It had been so wonderful when she was elected in 1953, getting to meet such titans such as Chesterton and Donville back when the proper sort of people still held dominance of both houses, and then it all had to come tumbling down. Fountain. That name echoed venomously through her mind when she saw the traitor stand and give a speech of his own. It was men like him and Butler, alongside their pack of cretin cretins, who dominated the Commons. Most of their old friends either moved up to the Lords or simply died. Now it was just her and a small clique around Donville left. When the time came around to vote for the bill, Lady Birdwood dutifully walked into the eye lobby, along with nearly the entire house. It was her duty as education minister after all, even if uh, she was surrounded by these leeches. And she still clung to hope that one day the old guard would take back what was rightfully theirs and regain control of Parliament. Until that day, however, she would keep on as ever, voting as she was meant to, and sa save her abiding criticisms for private discussions in the lounges. One day, oh, debt to GDP ratio actually went up. Look at that. Oh, inflation is much less. The growth is actually higher now. Fantastic. Excess, oh, the revenue, excess revenue, nice. Well, you know what, a little bit more debt for better, way better inflation? I'm okay with that. 
Uh, commitment and certainty. Though Fontaine is ramble may call them traitors or wolves in sheep's clothing, unions are not inherently evil. But it's true that they have been often used to foment dissent against the rightful government. We know that they're made up of hard-working, loyal British workers. Yet we cannot allow for the specter of communism to grow in unions again. To avert this, a new law will be proposed. One that sets up certain regulations that will make sure they're not used against us in any uprising. The 1962 fiscal report it seems a new decade has brought it with new hope. The economy, thanks to the many years of hard work put in by Britain and her people, has finally begun the process of recovering from the disastrous crash of the 50s. We're beginning to see some growth and increasing in trade with the Reich and their other partner states. We received offers of a particular excitement from Krupp and Volkswagen, who have offered to set up at least 20 more manufacturing plants across the country each. This will invigorate the job market, bringing further growth and lowering unemployment. Unfortunately, the good comes to bad, while res resistance activity has declined dramatically from what it once was. They still have plagued the countryside and the innermost areas of the city. Attacks uh, upon public works projects have increased by three times as much from last year. Localized, uh, particularly around the West Midlands and the North, in addition, these new investments from the German conglomerates have tethered our economies ever closer to that of the Reich. While there are some amongst us who see no issue with this, it places our newfound stability at risk should the Reich face any internal issues. That concludes the, concludes the report. The party is a mess, we must clean it up. Or in the desert, nice. Yeah, overall doing better. So we don't have this, we don't have this. Better, uh, Germania's finest. Oh god, the GDP growth is not very good. Uh, Jonathan could feel a bullet scraping the concrete next to him. He had taken a defensive position in an old bunker turned base of a resistance, and the fascists were outside the door. Fire a shot, only to be answered by ten more, each one getting closer, like the footsteps of a pursuing predator. These were not the king's soldiers or some government militia formed at the last minute. This looked more like the German invaders, the ones who had taken everything he ever loved 20 years ago. Yet the Union Jack patches on the uniform signified something other. Something perhaps worse, they were the British Free Corps, an extension of Germany's hand on the Isles, and staffed by the worst traitors and fascists Britain could offer. Jonathan had heard the rumors about them. Government forces struggling to keep things in order, but then the FBC came and all was done in a day, leaving nothing but the bullet holes and smoke. Before he could even turn and played with the captain for an attempt at retreat and escape, an explosion ripped through the complex. He spun around, baffled. Oh, my bad. It's auto-saving. Dang it. He was baffled, you know? He was real baffled. Uh, where it come from? Maybe the fascist poison has seeped him in the deepest part of the resistance? He wouldn't have time to take those thoughts any further, as out of the smoke of fire, a man in a coat and no helmet emerged, quickly approaching him. Flanked by four other men, his face twisted into a seemingly permanent smirk, oblivious of the corpse lying in the hall. Jonathan struggled to get up, only just noticing his legs had been buried in the fallen concrete of the ceiling. He could only hunch as the man in the dark coat approached him, a flash of confidence and disgust in his eyes. Screw you, you fascist... His sentence was cut short by a single shot to the head. All right, men, Thomas Holler Cooper shouted, clear this area of any vermin or traitor scum you find, and take whatever you like. Today is a victory for us in all Britain. We got a lot of work to do, still. An altered line. The endowment of British spears will give us some of the greatest, greatest marvels of the modern world. We're the ones who led the Industrial Revolution, and we've accomplished so much throughout the centuries. Together with Germany, British industry will become our boon once more. See, ownership in the south, huh? Southeast. We lower by five. That'll increase our stuff here too. So, because we're probably not going to be able to complete it, but we're going to try anyways. And we'll, you know what? I'm going to use const commands anyways to see what if we can do that. Um. So for this one, state ownership in the southeast region. State ownership is only forty six percent. Corporate ownership is twenty percent. So, if we can lower the corporate ownership, that'd be great. Because right now, corporate estate, and then it doesn't matter if AEG has an influence in here or not. It has no influence anyway, so this would be bad, and this wouldn't be worth worth, worth it. And there you go. So we have all three of these ready to go. Uh, is that even possible to complete? Two a month. So two a month, you need forty months. For a month, and AEG influence above the southwest here needs to be even higher. We're gonna do it anyways because I, I I want to. It said AEG influence, so. No, oh, I guess we have to wait. That god dang it. Oops. Well, I guess technically, if AEG influence is above twenty five percent, we can just lower whoever has the most influence here. The Reichsvelka. State ownership goes up. Yeah, so if you do the merchant's takeover powers, we could try that. 
Uh, let's say it first. Conversations with the snake as we read it. When Wilson had strolled into his office, smiling in what that oh so sly way he had seemingly mastered and that he had gotten them a meeting, Butler was apprehensive. He barely trusted Wilson, let alone the unions. Now waiting for the leaders to arrive, he remained cautious. He had a better view that the unions and most of the BPP, though that what didn't say much, considering his opposition were those who wanted to ban them and the others who wanted to shoot them. He tolerated them, like even liking a few of the leaders, but ever since the war he could never look at them without being reminded of the revolutionary elements, those who wanted to shoot him and stick his head on London Bridge. Regardless, he still acted as the best connection to the cabinet had to the unions, and as the meeting got him closer uh, to the N10, so be it. Five men enlisted, entered his office, all clearly working from working class backgrounds. Their faces aged visibly their past their years, and the suits tidy no fitting, and across in their eyes. But I looked into them and saw mistrust, well, he expected that, but in one he saw a visible burning hatred. He had predicted that they would mistrust him, and that was the kind of hatred was a but that kind of hatred was unexpected. Maybe that man was a member of the resistance, barely holding himself back from shooting Butler there and then, or maybe another benign reason. He supposed it didn't matter, and with invisible attention, the discussion started. Discussions went on for an hour, with Wilson sliding in wherever it was clear an argument was made erupt. In the end, Butler agreed to work on the legislation to improve pay and working conditions in the factory and negotiate with companies on their behalf. As they exited the room, giving crocodile smiles, he feared that all his discussion was pointless and they would return on him the moment an opportunity presented itself. Butler pushed his worries aside. He supposed these past 20 had made him a cynic, but then again, a cynic is what an idealist calls a realist. Very cool. Because right now, how much influence? 19%. Emergency takeovers, that's a lot. AUG is here to win. And actually, now what? Yeah, get rid of all of Oxfrica. Majority owned by AEG. So, I mean, we can get it done. It's just not going to get done, probably. Sucks. And now, the most ownership is the state. Cool. Love it. If it works. Increasing gears. Thanks to the diligent efforts of Butler, Bean, and our ever loyal civil, civil servants, our economy is on upturn again and found the path to final recovery. The reconstruction we started so long ago is near completion, yet our work has certainly just begun. With the economy once again roaring back to life, we can finally turn and not just create a stable economy, but a truly prosperous one. We can now turn and transform our economy into being more than just a subsidiary to the Reich, into a European economic power. With a newfound prosperity, Britain products will, uh, British products will once again fill the markets of Europe. Fantastic. Love it. And maybe we can build some hospitals now. Go figure. Mm -hmm. Nice. We got a lot to do here. Consumer goods production factory. Yes, please. More output. Yes, please. Naval stuff. We're going to go with a global fleet, even though there's no way in the world we'd ever be able to support a new global fleet. But whatever. You know. It is what it is. Private ownership. Uh, poverty rate, yeah, it says poverty. I want to get better poverty. And England's green and pleasant land. When the English countryside comes to mind, one is immediately overwhelmed with the imagery of green rolling hills, of a soft, gentle breeze blowing softly, and the sun hovers gently over the dutiful workers tilling the land. It is one of the greatest natural beauties of the world, and one of the greatest treasures of ours. Unfortunately, there are those men who have taken the countryside for granted. These men who prioritize a coin over all else, callously poison the land, building sprawling factories housing across once beautiful land, and this is to say nothing of the damage wrought by the bombings. Thankfully, there are many in the government who are both conscientious of nature's importance and willing to defend it. While himself was one of the founding members of the organistic, organist's kinship for husbandry during the war, it was here that he met several dedicated men and women who share the belief that Britain's natural beauty must be protective. It would perhaps be prudent to meet with the current leader of the group. Rolf Godinet, conversations with him are always illuminating and noble favor. As a disgrace is, is what it is, sniffed a thin, haughty looking woman clutching a teacup, producing a series of nods and murmured agreements from the rest of the aristocrats who reclining in the drawing room's spacious armchairs. They've turned Downing Street into a madhouse, and poor Hastings say the Prime Minister won't even find time to see him now, too busy wrangling his own party, or so they say. You can't blame the Prime Minister, Edith, chided a bespeckled man who was waving away a teapot carrying servants' worthless, wordless offer of more tea. He's doing the best he can, coming out of a difficult time, particularly with the sort of louts he's been stuck with. We can't forget what happened the last time Fontaine saw weakness from a Prime Minister. All the more reason to keep him away from the Downing Street, she replied. I don't mean to tell you what you should think in your own house, Percy, but to see a Home Secretary who spends his time with common street thugs is an outrage. And that butler, his worst, calling for a restraint against terrorists, even after all we've been through. Another round of murmurs and mutters of, here, here, following the impassioned outburst. Suddenly, a uh, portly noble pushed himself to his feet, causing every eye in the room to look at him. Then why aren't we doing anything about it? My friends, we all know how unfit those two are to be Prime Minister. And yet all we do is sit in here complaining. Are, are our opinions not worth more than those of the rabble that support Butler and Fountain? Let us lend our support to someone truly worth of the Avi. 
worthy of the office. And just who is this perfect champion of yours? asked Edith. This plum noble smiled. The Earl of Portsmouth. And they're going to talk about the price of collaboration. You get four production units. Better inflation. Better growth. Increase the GDP. What is not to love? I love better numbers for us. The life of Alexia Zag Zadroga had been a long, hard, and miserable one. Born under the boot and seemingly destined to die under it, his spark of rebellion had all but died out. Born in Imperial Russia, he was only a child when Poland was finally liberated, a nation free once more after 200, 100 years of tyranny. I love the word 200 for some reason. But that freedom was short-lived, a flicker of hope and centuries of misery. By the time he was old enough to enjoy the freedom of his nation, he was sent to war fighting a desperate defense against the Germans. It was all for naught, though, and Poland fell once more. From there, his life remained static, working in a concentration camp for 20 years upon the ashes of his former country day after day. He performed back-breaking work constructing the weapons that would be used to terrorize his people. Today was no different, except the parts were seemingly different uh, make than usual, but he took a closer look at the label. Seeing a foreign label, but it was familiar to him. Then it dawned on him. There was a British label on the product, something he had not seen since he was a minor Polish soldier. He remembered hearing about the fall of Britain through desperately trying to listen to the muffled discussions between the guards, while it was distraught by the news he had hoped. Britain would not go so quietly, the population would not surrender, and they would not and they would fight on, never giving the Germans the satisfaction of a victory, yet there was a British label in the camp. Britain, who had stood up for Polish independence with the Nazi domination, seemed certain, but was now trading freely with the Reich. If Poland's greatest ally was working with the Reich, what hope was there for Poland? The blood soaked cost of collaboration. The old unhappy lords, the Duke of Bedford and A.K. Chesterton, how far these times of British fascism have fallen since their time in power. Bedford, our founder, the man who brought us all together and led the BPP in rebuilding the Britain of old before corruption at the hands of the Judeo Bolsheviks and their puppets in the old parties. It's a shame that such a great man, who in many ways built the state we inhabit today, has fallen into obscurity after seven years as Prime Minister, with only a loyal friend such as Lord Portsmouth bothering to heed his counsel in the running of Britain today. But of the two, Chesterton has fared far worse. He once he was the very apex of British fascism, commanded the BPP as it marched forwards to forge a truly fascist state on the foundations Bedford left us, and how, alas, how cruel fate can be. For Chesterton was brought down before his time by the combined forces of treason and without and treachery within. Daggers plunged deep into his back by the uprising in 1956 and Andrew Fontaine's bench back backbench revolt. Despite this, this man remained our most experienced and venerable veterans. Whilst a, a front-line politics is out of the question, for now we shall enlist their help in bringing the lords back into line and perhaps pave the way for a proper exoneration of the legacy in the process. Brotherly Reunion Rolf Gardiner was many things, muse Gerard Wallop, a brother in the English ministry, <clears throat> who had followed him into the English array after they'd split, a philanthropist, an agriculturalist, a folk dancer and writer. But at the Earl of Portsmouth, he, he had and always would be one of his truest friends. It was all too fitting then that what he needed advice on the troubled state of Britain, he could turn to the same friend who hoisted, hosted him there so often. As a car pulled into the small city at Spring, he could not but smile a little at the familiar face waiting outside to greet him. Gerard Gardner cried with delight, giving his hand a firm shake. Please come in, Mar Maribel will be overjoyed to see you. How have you been, old bean? I hope London has been treating you too poorly. Wallop chuckled all as it as it can, with the company once forced to keep there. His face turned serious, though it certainly seems they have treated the country poorly. To tell the truth, I came here as much as for your advice as anything. His friend nodded and suddenly sobered. I was hoping you'd say so. You must have seen a Fontamel Magna as you drove in. Wallop nodded. Half the houses are in disrepair. London's completely forgotten parishes like this and are in favor of urban cities. Sometimes, Gerard, I feel like you're the only one out there who truly cares and focuses on the right things. Such as Douglas's series? Gardner had always been passionate about the subject, recalled the Earl, and in truth, social credit had made a great deal of sense to him as well. Had it been practical, he might have pushed it for further, but with Arthur's downfall, the time had never seemed quite right. It's the only way, old friend, insisted Gardner fervently. You believe it once more than anyone. It will keep you the key to England's salvation, while upon him, even thought, perhaps there was some truth to their old, his old friend's words. A close call. You, <clears throat> you get back here right now. Crap, 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 crap. Someone had decided to snitch on them to the local police, and now the silk mill was a no-go. One moment it was fine, and the next the police were knocking on the doors. Who could have been? She knew for a fact that it wasn't her, Lizzie, Old Bill, Mage, Harry, or Tom. That left Roy, Harry, Cal, and Bob. It was probably Cal. Ratty little dude always looked suspicious. Elizabeth ran through the streets, desperately ducking and weaving in, in and out of the alleyways. She could hear the telltale police sirens nearby and the rapid movement of the police officers. She didn't see anyone lead the same way she did, but she could only help that they were all safe. Well, 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 what's cracking off here then? Her blood turned to ice as she turned around and saw a rudy faced balding man in a police uniform like a toad-like smile stretch across his face. Crap, looks to me like you might have been running away from something. Mind if you come back to the station and answer a few questions? She spat on his shoes, making his smile turn into a uh, look of seething rage. You stupid little, the officer never got to finish his sentence, has rather beaten up old car and from behind the officer, knocking him over. Taken aback, Elizabeth only realized who her saver was, but she heard Emma calling her name from the car. She scrambled into the car and the couple took off into the night. 
As soon as they were far enough away from the danger, Elizabeth hugged her lover as hard as she could. You saved me, God knows what he would have done. Emma only gently kissed her on the forehead, only briefly taking her eyes off the road. Bill contacted me. We've got a new place sorted in the old cigarette factory uptown. I'll get us there, and then we can relax. Elizabeth nodded, falling asleep on Emma's shoulder. How many more of these are there going to be? More until... The beatings will continue until morale improves. Basically. 20% uh, chaos. But we have quite a few comments to go through as we're doing all the old unhappy lords. Uh, which you read earlier, so if you read this again, please go ahead. So, uh, someone says, uh, Hello, Prime Minister Mocha Lover. If you want to reduce the debt and grow the GDP, defund the military, reassign all the millions of civvies, which could work, and reduce spending. Poof, high GDP growth rate. Yeah, we, we, we must have got that here. I mean, I don't want to destroy the entire military, but we've done what we can, you know. Um, so, after this, we are definitely going to be doing uh, Among These Dark Satanic Mills. This is not. The time for restraint or compromise, the countryside is being torn apart by the German corporations and nothing but quick decisive action will stop it. For that reason, we must propose that the Prime Minister immediately begin restricting and displacing German industry from the countryside, taking a direct approach against it. While convincing it will be a great task due to our government requiring backing from the very same corporations, it must be done, also, ultimately. While the profiteering corporations may well be outraged, the German government itself may be convinced of the righteousness of our cause and allow these measures to be passed with the same spirit that led to the repeal of the Parliament Act and Fallen Titans. The first thing Wallop noticed about the Duke of Bedford's great estate purchased back in his family's possession um, back uh, during his time as Prime Minister was not the size of the grounds nor the grand of the building, but how empty it was. And so it was even gloomier than the gray exterior. A hollow house for a hollow man, attended to by a small cadre of apathetic servants and no one else. Lord Portsmouth felt nothing but pity when he saw the gaunt figure of Lord uh, Tavistock sitting in the living room. The man who found the BPP had been Britain's first proper post war prime minister reduced to a miserable husk of a man. Lord Tavistock, the Britain needs you now more than ever. The BPP is aimless, drifting without men, uh, meaning, mired in infighting entry. Please, Bedford, we have to act now, pleaded Wallop. Hoping that somewhere deeper than was still that bright beacon he followed so faithfully in the years past. I appreciate what you're trying to do here, Portsmouth, I really do. A.K. Chesterton said, having arrived a few hours before Wallop, he produced a silver flask from his pocket and tipped it back down his throat with a shaky ham. A cinch of alcohol filled the room, but tell us honestly, do you really think we have a chance once Donville joins us in retirement? Yes, yes I do, Wallop replied, getting up from his seat. He stood before the dilapidated image of his old allies, memories of rousing speeches and excited gatherings rushing to the fore. England lies at her lowest point since Cromwell. Our land is mutilated by foreign conglomerates, and the people set on carrying out the dangers to their homeland and arrogant upstarts are on the verge of destroying everything we've striven for. We cannot afford to surrender such an act would be treason in the face of this mortal peril. I ask you, both of you, to pick up your swords one last time and rejoin the fight for Britain's very soul. Bedford and Chesterton glanced at each other, and when they turned back to face Wallop, you could see some of the old fire flicking away again in their aging eyes. Their support secured. Uh, so we need more party support here. So, Party? No weekly change? This doesn't do anything, apparently, so. Which kind of sucks. Another comment includes, Restore Democracy. Uh, someone else says, Why not place Himmler? It's right now, at the time of this recording, there's no content for Himmler, of course. Someone says, Restore Democracy as well as be honest if the fascist stays. The OFM would invade once you try to liberate Ulster from the Irish. And uh, honestly, the OFM would do nothing if the collaborationists win. And there's no decisions for, about Ulster in the UK right now, so. Someone says, Rest in peace, Wales. Rest in peace. Well, they're Welsh. What do you expect? Nothing but love, right? That's right. Nothing but love. Yeah. Another yeah. comment says, I really like the new content for Britain and TNO. You can feel the fascism has established a foothold in the UK, and that the Germans are watching what Britons are doing. Even though now it's just a few years of content, it looks amazing, and I can't imagine how good will Britain will be when both collaborators and Himmler have full content in the future. Someone says, I miss Douglas Home and Thatcher. Someone says, Come on, Free Britain, but unfortunately there's no comment. No content yet. Who says, In the next episode, you could probably start with Prime Minister Mokalover. Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Also says, British fascism is like German National Socialism, but wholesome. Nice. Among the brown winter fog, uh, Jude Shaw paced the walkways of the industrial tannery, with his owner, Stefan Brunk, trailing behind him. The workplace inspector had arrived without notice, emerging on this Friday morning with no notice whatsoever. A snap inspection, and one that had arrived much sooner than expected. <clears throat> Oh yeah, Borunk found the inspector's attitude to be perplexing. He walked around with a clipboard in hand, but he wrote nothing down. They, they walked around a cattle, catwalk with wobbling railings. Workers attended to their stations with missing fingers. Only half of the employees here had proper protective equipment. Even as he was confronted by numerous workspace or workplace safety violations that would make a foreman in Guangdong blush, Shaw did not mark his form. Of course, uh, th Borunk, this was just a fun raising drive. By the time they returned to the entrance, Brunk wore a knowing smile. Thank you for your time, Inspector, said Brunk in his harsh continental accent. He held on an envelope with a smile. I trust that you found everything satisfactory. Shaw swiped his clipboard against the envelope. 
Taking it away from his fingers, the council was very displeased to see the level of irresponsible management in the factory. Brunk's jaw, jaw hung open. Soil samples taken from the area surrounding this property show an unacceptably high level of chromium. Have you been buying waste illegally, he sighed? No matter, this factory is shut down effective immediately until the waste has been removed. As Shaw walked back to the factory to shut it all down, Brunk slid into the side door, racing up his office, and immediately placed a call to the Royal Mail, demanding an urgent telegram to be sent to his employers in Germany. English government shut down factory without cause. Ur urgent assistance required. Mm. I will not cease from mental, the mental fight. Oh. Oh, this helps pragmatists, too. Well, I wanted, uh, no matter what, poverty. So remind me the next time I'll get a given rights, huh? Increase the GDP. I don't want to lose our GDP, too. Honestly, this would have been better. Probably to do. Yeah. Whoops. No, this is part of... Well, technically, I don't know. Pragmatists get 5% influence over both. Two things. Ideologues get a little more part influence on the party. Influence of the peers. Influence of the party. And more stability. But this one just gives you to, straight to the pragmatists. Oh, not cease for the mental fight. My bad. There's no mere matter of failing ideological commitment in the House of Lords. It is this exalted house, which is once such a noble representation of the traditions of our nation, has now rotted from the inside. Worse yet, its prestige and influence are gradually being sapped away by the insidious influence of the mega corporations. We need to prepare a speech extolling the importance of the British countryside. We shall not cease from this mental fight, and by the time we finish, both the fascist and or organists faction will have no choice but to finally help in striking down this treacherous kin. Shining forth upon the cloud, the cities in the cloud, the cloud hills, yeah. And thus call upon the countenance divine. Crap, we're gonna destroy our GDP again. Uh, there are traitors in the House of Lords that continue despite all of the guidance that I have offered them. We have offered them to show disloyalty to the good cause of the British People's Party. While some of them are simply seen out of fools with their own delusions of governance, others insist on whoring their lands out to the whims and fancies of the Germans. This cannot be tolerated. We and our allies must join together to directly attack such treason in the Lords. Whether it be uh, through backroom discussions, economic pressure, even leveraging the black troops against them, the lords will kneel. This must remain a secret, however. Domville's patronage is strong, but so too are the sinister forces that work against us. Absolutely, and come to church in time. So it's only going to destroy GDP. That's all. Until we have built Jerusalem, too. Hmm. Interesting. Um, slightly more private ownership, which is mm, maybe not the best thing for us, actually. Early warnings. Ooh, not good. Hey, inflation is actually more in control. Which is good. National, even though we can't get the state ownership in the southeast. Well, we'll see what happens in the end. Uh, yeah. We don't need it. I know we don't, but I want to do it anyways. So, state ownership in the southeast is above 50%. It's a lot of political power, but there you go. Corporations, Deutsche Bank has most of it, so. Huh, I'll do unemployment a little bit, maybe. Early warnings, meteorology was rarely a rewarding career. David's father told him in this when he decided to study at Liverpool. He said that some other science would be more rewarding of his talents, that he deserved better, yet David had his passions, and he graduated all the same, 20 years on. With much less hair and much more bitterness, he often wondered if his father was right. Nice. Even without the added stress of the German invasion that had almost put David out of a job because of employment guidelines, the career was a thankless, joyless job. And on top of all that, funds had been extremely limited. David's two decades of work here were unremarkable. None of the groundbreaking discoveries he had set out to make all those years ago, just largely uninteresting weather reports. As he pulled up to the office in his cheap car, there's no reason to think today would be any different from the myriad others he had spent wasting away here. And yet, as he looked at the recent data, his brow began to furrow severely. Grim patterns were emerging in the forecast of weather for the next year. More and more winds blowing from the east, lower temperatures, and a lot. All these scattered reports led him to the one dark conclusion a truly awful winter was coming to Britain, one of the country he hadn't seen in a century. He frantically went to works, writing a report that detailed the worsening weather, alongside the measures that could be put in place to avert disaster. As he went to post the letter, he could only hope that the men in Downing Street would take his warnings to heed. In London, the paper was received swiftly and placed in a ministerial box. It was quickly forgotten, just another warning of doom to quickly be forgotten. Donville sip dot seven a seven one dot a. Until we built Jerusalem. But all a good show of there ever was one Lord Portsmouth endeavors to rally the old guard attending to the countryside's woes, and reel the House of Lords back into line of gun marvelously well, and the Prime Minister can rest easy knowing he has appeared his full support. During the task, however, Wallop himself has become noticeably perturbed by the state of things, and is convinced that further action needs to be taken to find a lasting solution to not just the issues of the Lords, but also matters concerning the whole country. The old guard is still on shakier ground than arrivals, and the Germans continue to reeb as they wish across the country, and the matter of inactive, apathetic peers remains unresolved. Wallop wishes to retake this 
personal crusade into his own government agenda. And whilst there's little time left in the Dawnville Ministry to do so, would such a task not be a most worthy cause of the successor to the champion? Nice. Nice. Someone says, uh, uh, the comments from Mr. Say Say. First, they take my Alanthropa and now they divided UK? Oh god, no. Yeah, pretty much. Oh god, look at this. The oncoming storm was late on this evening. The cabinet of the UK was called in for an emergency meeting by pr the Prime Minister. All who could attend were quickly rushed through the London's chilly streets to Downing Street, where Donville anxiously waited them, tormented by the knowledge that what was, what was to come. To put it plainly, gentlemen, we're about to face the worst winter since the days of George II, said Domfield. Relieved that most of the cabinet have been able to come. Fountain and Butler among them. Projections show that if we fail to act, hundreds could die of the cold as the energy grid is strained to the breaking point. In a worst case scenario, the whole villages could be freeze to death as the heating falls. We need to move quickly and mobilize our workers to increase energy output, suggested Fountain, drawing upon the approval of the many of those assembled. Uh, with proper motivation, our miners uh, will be able to temporarily increase our coal reserves enough that we can meet the increased demand. For once, I agree with you, Andrew, said Butler, surprising his rival. However, we should look to see if our German friends can help us through the crisis as well. We are in a unity pact, after all. They can't exactly refuse to help an ally in need. Over the next few hours, an emergency response plan was drawn up and sent out to the relevant ministries to implement a priority. As a priority. While I was pleased to see the cabinet working together for once, Donville knew this was only the beginning of what was needed to counteract the potential crisis before it became a real one. There was something else, though, something else that unsettled him as he lay in bed that night. Was this merely a, a bad start to the year or a sign of things to come? Brittany needs a doctor now more than ever. A new crisis will appear in the workshop of the mechanic. A page. Ache for purpose. Ben quietly shut the front door, not wanting to wake his mother this time. The shifts at the factory were getting later and later, which meant she often ended up falling asleep before he got back, slinging his raggedly bag on the kitchen table. He walked over to the pantry, feeling absolutely famished after Dave non stopped laboring. These German taskmasters did not like to let up for anything it felt like. Still, money was money upon her, taking out some bread, margarine, and preserved meat from the cupboard. It was a fit and healthy lad, and it was just him and his mom. If he didn't bring in any money, then nobody would, and the bills would go unpaid. But as he had spread the margarine onto his bread, he couldn't help but wonder one thing. How many more nights like this? How long would it be until he went out to bigger and bigger things? Or would he stay in the city until the day he died like his dad? Shaking his head, Ben sat down and tucked it into the sandwich. The ingredients were all extremely cheap, but after a shift, it could have been a five-star meal in his eyes. It would have been the same again tomorrow, and then the same day after that. I think on Sunday he'd be able to properly relax for once. The fire of youth is hard to keep dimmed. <coughs> and come to church in time. He's light, said Lord Anderson, glancing at his watch absentmindedly. Burnham uh, nodded and leaned back into the cushion of bench to a lazily sprawl. Well, it really was taking his time in arriving today, and showed in his bored attitude of the Lord's waiting, he leaned in to whisper back to Anderson. Perhaps he's, he's here, interrupted a voice sitting behind them. Burnham quickly uh, pushed himself up off the cushions to look at the floor where Walt was making his way to the speaker's podium. He paused once to reach it, contemplating the room with an unreadable expression, then he spoke. My lords. The this venerable and ancient institution has stood as a beacon of guidance for all of Britain since its foundation. As the upper house, it follows to us to distinguish laws of good character from the bad, he said, a number of class following. I ask you then, how can we do that when the character of this house itself has been plagued by decay and corruption? The clapping immediately went, dwindled to a halt, replaced by a tense murmuring. While it was sneering disdainfully at several lords now, including himself, including him, Burnham squinted, reluctant to meet the Earl's stare. Finally, Walt looked away. I vow that I shall not let this continue. To remedy this, a commission shall be founded with the new investigative powers to restore the honor of their grant's institution. It's a bluff, whispered Anderson, confidently leaning him. It's the support he needs. He'll never be so bold as to really do it. Of course, yes, whispered Burnham back. He made a mental note to meet with... Vogel to tell the German to keep his mouth shut. As long as he did that, the crazed so fanatic that was Gerard Wolf could, would leave him alone. A full week passed. A concerning session had nearly passed from Burnham's memory when one Sunday morning he saw the sight of a car approaching his Brookshire estate. An official emerged from the car and introduced himself as a commissioner, but Burnham wasn't focused on him. He only saw four black shirts accompanying the army issue. Ooh. More money, oh no. Uh... Focus on the urban areas. I want to do the party first. In the long history of the party, many political parties have sought to guide our nation towards a stronger, more prosperous future. From the Tories to the Liberals, all have sought to push their vision for Britain. Yet in the end, all their plans were laid to waste with the fall of the old order, and in their place rose the BPP, a party that could rebuild a broken Britain and truly make it strong. However, though we are united in our goals, our party is divided into two key camps, the ideologues and the pragmatists. Tensions between these factions have been building up for two decades now, and the upcoming party conference shall be the crescendo for this conflict, and decide who shall lead a party into the future. Uh, someone says, play as Chesterton, Chesterton, Chesterton. Um, currently, he's not in the game, because this is an updated for, one for this one. Uh, someone says, I'm wondering if you ever do Octan's Samara. For a man who plays a horrible dystopian nations, you've been really sleeping on Octan. Have I not played Octan? She plays Octan sometime. 
Cool. Uh, so says, Britain is no longer divided. That's no fun. TNO has really gotten not absurd recently. What a shame. Jerusalem. It wasn't often that Barry Donville had people around for dinner. Rare was it still for it to be anything other than a state formality with some packed ambassador, whose nation had been something Britain had needed. But tonight, for the first time in a long time, he found himself dining with the company of a true friend and with a real cause to elaborate too, to celebrate too. For Wallop's attempts to rally the lords and start the process of cleaning house had gone brilliantly. However, in between jokes, sips of wine, and mouthfuls of steak, Donville noticed that Wallop seemed down. His gaze looking on the paintings that surrounded them and his plate remained mostly full. Is there something in the matter of Gerard? You seem awfully low for a man celebrating a triumph, he asked. It just began Wallop sitting down in the cutter his cutlery. I just can't stop thinking about how much we could, more we could have, but we should have done. The Germans still own half the countryside. We haven't even had a chance to make a new English character, and Germania still treats us like a vassal state. We need to do more, Barry. We have to. To all surprise, Donville's reaction to his tire was laughter, the first real after laughter he had heard from his friends and ears. You still got the old fire in you, huh? Not like an old battleship like me quite yet, are you? Things may be far from perfect, that is true, but it could still be worse. After all, I don't think the elders of Zion are in any state to orchestrate our downfall anymore, are they? Now his wallops turned to laugh. The victory over usury had become a sweet one, yes, but his mind soon became clouded once more as he pictured a grinning at obs where he his hands from atop a pile of looted English coins. Still, I want to do more. I can see all these problems blotting our land, and it's infuriating not having the power to do anything about it. It's like I'm always stuck in the 30s. Seeing Lord Portsmouth's zeal and passion was, a, was as alive as it was 30 years ago, a question suddenly occurred to Dom, though that he had not seriously considered in years, having resigned himself, to having no say in the answer at all. But now, something had changed that the old guard, the champion of their own, could while it be more than an ally? Could he be an error? But falling short. It's with great regret that his government reports a number of shortfalls and setbacks in the implementation of economic plans for 1962. Andrew Fontaine barely paid attention to Butler's excuses. Whatever he said, the numbers from his department spoke more plainly. He failed to meet his precious goals, and now the economy was weak. They remained stone-faced, projecting an aura of determination. All around were frustrated colleagues, half of the bench, uh, backbenchers, and front of Fontaine were, were frowned so deep they looked like the corners of their mouth had been weighted. The government pledges to redouble its effort to meet new goals, which will outline presently in the 1963 budget. Nothing less than a shakeup of our department it will be necessary if we are to deliver on our promises of sustained growth and full employment. Fontaine's eyes briefly locked with Dom, who was sat beside uh, behind Butler. There was a mutual disappointment there, sealed by a single shrug from the Prime Minister. Finally, I thought Fontaine, he started to realize it. The glance broke away quickly, and both men returned to Butler. The government further pledges that we will revisit and deepen our existing relationships with industry leaders, particularly those from the German corporations to ensure that the prosperity remains an achievable state. Butler was clearer than Fontaine expected. He was anticipating a waterfall down the Chancellor's ashamed face. Perhaps he still thought he had the situation under control. The next year might right the wrongs of this year, but all those numbers he relied on to prove his worth and said otherwise. And thus there was an opportunity for Fontaine. If the so-called pragmatists were also empty rhetoric, then why not sign up for the more exciting rhetoric? A messed up, nothing more. Loose lips sink ships. Another night, another call. The recent winter had, winter had plunged the government into a state of crisis. Everyone had been sent into a panic with practically every department working overtime to try and stop the people from freezing to death. The RAF was no exception, although the work was less bureaucratic than many. Michael and his squad had early been forced to air the five people from their frozen over homes in the last few days that such was the state of the country. When reports of snowbound policemen got caught in the snap freeze whilst training new recruits came in, the pods were once again sent out into the biting cold. You could feel the frost steeping into the rattly machine. Would have it killed the engineers who have added some sort of insulation to these things? As a way to distract themselves from the cold that added them all shaking in their boots, Michael got to talking with his co-pilot Sam as often as he did. We were really bloody unprepared for this, you know. I mean, my mother almost froze to death in her home last week. Barely survived, she did. The government my mom grew up with wouldn't uh, have been this poorly prepared. He shook his head. Heck, maybe just as government, Sam said, they've been blundering from one crisis to the next. Even if I could run Britain better than those smug lords, maybe your mom was right. Maybe we do need. Explosion ripped across a Northumbrian sky. As remains of a helicopter crashed down to a nearby field after a short and swift investigation. The resistance was found to be guilty of the crime. Another government spokesperson quickly denounced the crime, arguing that only the strong hand of the BPP could order to be restored to Britain and keep it safe from threats such as these. Another few bodies to add to the count. And a firm grip versus... Oh, a fair hand. In the years of turmoil and uncertainty following sea land, the British government has had perhaps no greater ally in reconstruction than the pragmatists of the BPP. While many of their like-minded contemporaries fled across the waves or slunk underground to join the resistance, these men opted to stay in aid in rebuilding Britain despite their views on the role of democracy. Not 20 years later, Butler and his pragmatists sent as key pillars of the BPP, with the work they did in securing the aid of the mega corporations proving utterly invaluable. In recent years, they have proposed measures to offer even more fair-handed style of governance. While some would accuse of this weakness, 
This a weakness. We know that, that for the new order to come to Britain, this population must accept it willingly. Rab Butler is the future of our party, an open party which gracefully looks uh, to the past while marching forward. So, in the meantime, I clicked on here. I don't see anything for, about a crisis though. Inflation's okay. We need okay on inflation. That's actually fantastic. Unemployment's eight and a half, so it's getting better, and GDP growth is three point two percent, which is not great, but hey, it could be a lot worse. So, other than that, I don't. S oh wait, there's another one here. Oh crap. Oh whoops, I didn't. Even, I didn't know if you could scroll down here. Oh, uh, whoopsie. My bad. Well, it's bugged anyways. So, uh, someone did say in the comments, but why did why? why? There should be an arrow pointing here as it goes further down. I didn't even realize there was a thing here. My bad. But hey, if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see what else we can do with the good old workshop of the world, Great Britain. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of, or United Kingdom, rest of your day.